Okay, so that's one similarity. And this sort of pseudo-gap phenomena has now been reproduced in with various types of doping. Rather than potassium, people with, with lanthanum in it, they say the same thing. You can hold dope rather than electron dope with rhodium. Um, and again, you see similar phenomena. Okay, so this slide just starts to show that the pseudo gapping nearness seems to be somewhat ubiquitous. I remember that in the concrete, you don't tend to see the backside of the arc. But that's right. You seem to see the backside of the concrete. Right, that's right. So that, that has to do with two, this, this, uh, this uh, root 2 by root 2 distortion. That just holds it back. Oh. Yeah. So, so it, it's. I should have said it's here as well. It's suppressed here uh, because of Arpa's matrix element effects. But it's actually there. If you change the photon energy, you see it. Um, so this group just went to a different photon energy. I see. Okay. And what's more remarkable um, are studies that were published very recently, which shows that as you start to, as you, if you start in the pseudo gap regime, you start lowering your temperature. At some point, the pseudo gap converges into, you know, that, that gapless segment of your Fermi arc collapses into a node. And so you get a low temperature structure that looks like a D-wave gap. Okay, so this has been shown by both photoemission, which I'm showing here, as well as STM. Um, the nature of this D-wave gap has not been confirmed to be coming from superconductivity, but the signature is, is, is pretty convincing. Okay. So I'll repeat. Uh, let's, let's, say, let's say the uh, you know, clues that it's superconducting are pretty strong. Okay. Um, but there's no you know, zero resistivity. <coughs> so let me flash again a uh, slide that the previous speaker showed, um, which is this complex phase diagram of the cuprates. Okay. So I won't go into detail since it was already discussed, but I'll, I will draw a parallel to what we know about the area so far. We know that it's an antiferromagnetic line insulator at half filling. We know that as you dope, you, you, I didn't say this, but you do uh, suppress the nail temperature pretty quickly as a function of doping, and you give birth to this pseudogap regime. And there are now clues that you know, somewhere around here, perhaps there's a superconducting dope. Well, that's, that's still uh, not fully established, but evidence is consistent with that picture. And so the part of this problem that I'm going to tackle today with nonlinear optics has to do with what underlies the pseudo gap regime. Okay, so in cuprates, there there has been this debate about whether the pseudo gap is you know just a, just fluctuations of a of a some superconducting order parameter, or whether it's some um, competing uh, phase with a distinct broken symmetry. Um, and we'll address sort of uh, the broken symmetry side of that question in your today. So let me change gears a little bit and tell you about our technique. Um, Nonlinear optics turns out to be a very good method of looking at symmetry breaking for the for reasons that I'll become clear in a second. So the this is the so here here's the equation for the source term of Maxwell's equations. Okay, that's S. You can perform multiple expansion into you know electric dipole, magnetic dipole, electric quadrupole contributions, and so forth. In each of these induced multiples um, is sourced by some external field. So for example, when you look at uh, linear response, when you just measure linear reflectivity, uh, you're measuring um, the induced electric dipole uh, owing to an applied electric field. So nonlinear optics uh, is just a generalization of these kinds of processes, but uh, rather than absorbing one power of the electric field or one power of the magnetic field, you're absorbing higher power. So in the second order, the electric dipole process, for example, you're absorbing two photons of energy omega, and spitting out one photon of energy to omega. That's the basic picture. Here's why nonlinear optics is, is quite nice. If you just look at the linear response, which is governed by these sort of uh, three by three tensors, okay, um, what you find is that by Neumann's principle, the symmetries of the crystal have to be embedded in the structure of these <coughs> tensors. Okay, so in principle, if you know the structure of these tensors, you can back out the symmetry. Um, but in linear response, there's a, you know, you're, you're limited by the fact that there's so few tensor elements. And so many different crystal systems give you the same structure, such that if you were to measure this, you know, to infinite accuracy, you still wouldn't be able to differentiate between certain types of crystal data. So for example, um, the trigonal, trigonal and hexagonal crystal classes all give you a tensor structure that looks like this. 
So the one basic thing that nonlinear buys you is, is another tensor element. So as you get higher rank in your tensor, you not only begin to gain the ability to differentiate between different crystal classes, but you start to gain the ability to differentiate between different point groups within a crystal class. Okay. So what this is showing, these are just the triangle point groups, and uh, this is on the left, and on the right are the non-zero independent elements of this tensor that um, each of these different point groups would realize. Okay. And as you go higher and higher rank, you, you know, increasingly uh, are able to differentiate between these different point groups. So the, the experiment we carry out is basically the following. We shine a beam of light on the sample. We measure light coming on. The linear response is governed by something that looks like this, which we've talked about already. Um, we'll focus today on the second harmonic response, which is sort of the simplest nonlinear output process. And this response, you know, is typically dominated by the electrodipole contribution, which is, as I mentioned, two powers of the electric field at frequency omega giving rise to one output photon at frequency two omega. However, it turns out that second harmonic, um, that this process vanishes if your crystal has centrosymmetry. So if your crystal respects inversion, then any polar tensor that is odd rank is going to vanish by symmetry. Okay. And so in those cases, you're left with these higher rank multipole contributions that um, in your signal. So again, signal harmonic is very sensitive to the presence or absence of global inversion symmetry. Now, in addition to being sensitive to inversion symmetry, we also carry out a type of measurement called rotational line isotropy. And that gives you sensitivity to A, angular anisotropy, uh, but also this is a way that um, enables you to map out this entire tensor structure. Okay, so the basic experimental setup is this. You come in with a beam of light. You isolate, in our case, the second harmonic. And you measure the intensity of the output as a function of this angle phi, which is the angle between the scattering plane and some crystalline axis that you're choosing. Let's say the AC, AC plane. And by varying the polarizations between S and P on the input and output sides, um, it turns out you can be sensitive to all these, typically at least, you can be sensitive to all the tensor elements and therefore reconstruct your tensor. Okay, so let me tell you some experimental, uh, some experimental details about it. How this works and why it's challenging. One of the problems is that iridates, and this is typical for many correlated electron materials, um, look something like this. Right? They're not nice, shiny, shiny flat wafers. Right? These are crystals that are that arrive in your mail millimeters in size that look like dust. You have to cleave them, and then upon looking under an optical microscope, you find terraces, cracks, and so forth. And so you've got to do that sort of rotational anisotropy measurement on the cleanest, smoothest part of the sample as, as, you, as you can find. Okay. This means that you can't afford any, any walking of the beam on the sample. Certainly you don't want to walk across the terrace, but even within the terrace, you don't want to, you want to not sample you know, different regions of your crystal. You want to stay in the same region. Um, you don't want any precession of the reflected light. So if you don't align things right, the reflected light is you're rotating the uh, plane of polarization, so it's start precessing. And as I'll mention in a second, the light levels we're talking about are on the single photon level. And these single photon counters, if you start, if your light starts processing, that you know, can compromise your signal. So you don't want precession. Um, and typically, these experiments have been done on sort of large area flat single crystals, for, for the reasons I, I mentioned. And so, you know, the crystals like this are, have, have sort of not been um, part of this ballgame. Um, there are additional challenges. You know, you ought, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an experiment that involves mechanically moving parts. That's very hard to do at cryogenic temperatures. Um, it's very hard to do in external magnetic or strain fields. So you've got to rotate those fields as your experiment is uh, taking place. Um, and so here's our solution. Okay, so let me walk through this in, in a minute. Um, first of all, well, it's a bit complicated. So let me, let me start up top with our laser source. We have to use pulse lasers because the conversion efficiencies of these materials are incredibly low. Okay, so we exploit the high peak fields of our lasers in order to get measurable quantities of nonlinear output. So we start off with what's called a regeneratively amplified TISAF laser that's operating at 1.5 electron volts and a 10 kilohertz repetition rate. That seeds what's called an optical parametric amplifier that basically enables you to tune uh, the central wavelength of those pulses between you know, visible to, to let's say near infrared in our case. 
That selected wavelength gets polarization filtered, goes through a wave plate, and gets focused on this critical optic called the phase mask, which is a transmission, which is a diffraction gradient in transmission. So what this phase mask does is it splits your beam up into all diffractive orders, which I'm only going to this really from plus and minus orders of. We block one of them, we let the plus one get recollimated through the second lens, then it goes through an objective, in our case we use a reflective objective to minimize dispersion. It's focused down to the sample inside of a cryostat or a magnetic, uh, magnetic cryostat, if you like. The reflective harmonics get reflected off and travel through a diametrically opposite path. They get picked off by this decut mirror, sent through some polarization and spectral filters, and into our single photon cameras, either photomultiplier tubes or EM CCD cameras. Ten, ten minutes. No. The important thing is if you put some of these optics on rotating stages, then effectively you're, you're um, implementing a rotating scattering plane rather than, rather than rotating sample. Okay, so this overcomes some of those issues I mentioned earlier. This is essentially sort of the, you know, the, skeleton, the, the bare skeleton of what we're doing, right? We're ro rotating a scattering plane in this, in this fashion. And this keeps the sample totally stationary, which allows you to do things in very uh, low temperature environments, in uh, you know, static field environments. And as I'll show you in a second, it enables us to do things on very small crystals and as a scanning experiment. So rather than, let me go back a few slides, rather than letting one beam of light through, for alignment purposes, what we do is we remove this beam block and let both beams come through and converge on a sample, thus forming what's called an optical grating. And this optical grating um, acts as sort of a ruler for us. Okay, so this is the type of grating, you can see this is how the grating evolves as the sample is the scattering phase rotating. Using this kind of optical ruler, we can tell how far we, you know, how far we've moved as we, as we're rotating the scattering plane. So we can sort of find some marker on the sample, let's say a defect, and we can sort of quantify how much our beam moves from uh, blocks around on the sample. And, and in our case, we can get things to better than about a micron. The spacing between these fringes also tells you about the angle of incidence between these two beams. Okay, and by making sure that that uh, wave vector stays constant as we rotate around our scattering plane, um, we make sure that our precession angle is fixed. Uh, excuse me, make sure that our precession is minimized. Okay, which, remember I told you is important. So we can, we can minimize that precession angle to something below 0.05 degrees, which is pretty good. Okay, uh, I should say, let me say one word. So, you know, actually the setup I told you about is a little bit obsolete in that we use a different setup in our lab now. Um, nowadays, instead of having a detector that rotates along with your scattering plane, we now just sort of project everything onto a two-dimensional detector. And so we can form these so-called rotational lines so we scan as much more quickly than we used to with uh, much higher sensitivity because we're doing it at much higher frequency. Okay, so I'll, I'll get through this. I'll get back to this at the end if you have questions. Um, so let me start off by, by uh, first doing an exercise on this running to iridium 4 sample, um, namely by just resolving crystallographic structures first. So, you know, up until about 2013, this was the state tetragonal space group that was considered correct for this compound. And towards the end of 2013, some more careful neutron diffraction studies revealed frag peaks that were forbidden within the space group. And so there was some confusion about, you know, whether or not the space group might be incorrect, whether this was due to defects, uh, parasitic phases, and so forth. So let me show you the way we do structural refinement. These are four rotational, this is data, this is four rotational, rotational anisotropy second harmonic generation patterns taken from the 001 surface of strontium to iridium 4 uh, with an energy tube to the charge transfer resonance in this material. And these four patterns basically are the four different polarization geometries. Remember, your input and output can both be either S or P. So that's four geometries. And what you can do is, just like you do in diffraction, you can, you can <coughs> calculate what these patterns should look like in various symmetry groups, try to fit them to your data, and, and choose the one that fits best. So for example, don't worry, you know, I didn't want to, I don't want to get into details on this. So for example, you can, these are three, um, these are three point groups that were proposed to explain the diffraction data. You can generate the patterns expected from these groups and fit them to our data. And these are shown underneath. And you, can, you can see that none of them, none of them fit our data. Uh, this is the, oh, one more. this is the original 
structure that was proposed. That sort of does a little bit better job with our data, but it doesn't do so um, as well for these two patterns. And basically what we find is that you know, there's a symmetry lowering, um, whereby you remove these so-called CD glide planes. But in, in essence, there's a lower symmetry point group that fits our data rather wonderfully. So this is sort of how we go about doing uh, structure refinement. Okay, so that was the crystallographic structure, which we concluded uh, is due to this um, two sublattice uh, detrigal distortion between uh, of the uh, oxygen and the well, let me get to let me now get to the important stuff. So those data sets I showed you were, were room temperature, and this is a reproduction of just two of the polarization geometries, P and S out, P and P out. Right? And what you'll notice is that um, this, <coughs> as I mentioned, this uh, is consistent with this I for one slash A space group, or the four slash M point group. Um, it's inversion symmetric, and it's got fourfold rotational symmetry. Now, we can do these experiments now as a function of temperature because of our technique. And as you cool down, you see these dramatic changes happen to the patterns. Most visibly, you see that, first of all, you know, the fourfold rotational symmetry is broken down to from C4, fourfold to C1, where you have no rotational symmetries, essentially. And you can do the same thing. You can actually fit these patterns to you know, lower symmetry uh, point groups and determine what those are. Um, so there are reasons that we decided to fit to the magnetic point groups. Um, and it turns out that of all the magnetic subgroups of this 4 slash M point group that we surveyed, the largest one that fits our data is this 2 prime slash M, or M1 prime, they do an equally good job, but we'll focus on 2 prime slash M, which is basically a, a point group that carries a 2 prime operation, which is 180 degree rotation, time reversal, and a mere symmetry along the AB plane. Okay. And this point we're going to break inversion symmetry um, so that you allow an electric dipole contribution suddenly. And that's one of the reasons why these effects are so strong, I think. <coughs> so one of the I mean one of the possibilities, at least one um, one model of what's been happening in the pseudo-gap phase of cuprates has been the so-called Theta two loop current order. Okay. So we can't say anything about you know microscopically what's going on, but the <coughs> symmetries are consistent with this. this <coughs> Here's what's happening. Here's our iridium oxygen square plaquette. If you imagine circulating current loops forming on the opposite corners of this plaquette, then you form this sort of local you know intra-unit cell electric quadrant. This sort of ordering will break your um, Inversion symmetry and also breaks time reversal, which sort of motivated our um, magnetic point group assignment. Um, and the problem with this sort of phase that's plagued other measurements is that um, naturally you expect four degenerate sort of ground states. And so if you perform any sort of sample to average measurement, you're not going to see this, um, you're not going to see the symmetry break. Because if you average them all of these, the four-fold rotational symmetry is contained. <coughs> Beyond that, this is hard to measure for other reasons. It's Q equals zero. It doesn't break translational symmetry. Um, there's no net magnetization. And as I mentioned, there's this domain issue. So to over overcome that domain issue, we did a, a second harmonic imaging study. So here is, so basically what we do is we, we fix our rotation, we fix our scattering plane angle at some, some value, and we take an image, a far field image of our sample um, at that angle. So this is high temperature, what the crystal looks like. It looks pretty uniformly illuminated. Um, there's some calcium beam profile that makes the spot brighter here, but um, that's not intrinsic to the sample. And as you cool it down, you see this patchwork start to develop. Okay? And what we can do is, after taking this wide field scan at low temperatures, we keep the sample at low temperature, and then we focus our beam back down onto little spots so that we can sample each of these domains. And if you sort of exhaustively sweep your beam, so sweep your small beam through the sample, um, what you find is there are only four domains. Okay, there are four, basically exactly four copies of what I showed you earlier, rotating each by 90 degrees from one another. Okay, so this is consistent with the sort of loop current order parameter, although as I said, we can, we can say nothing about the microscopic mechanism for now. The other thing we can do is we can dope these samples. Okay, so it's, you know, as I showed you in the context of the pseudo gap, you can rhodium dope these to affect hole doping. 
and what um, other groups have shown that upon whole doping, you want to monotonically suppress your magnetic ordering temperature. Um, and groups have drawn phase diagrams showing this sort of anti ferrodynamic phase boundary that looks something like this. Okay? So if we, we decide to look at temperature dependence of this signal as a function of doping, so let me show you sort of one, one doping for, for now, and then I'll show you the rest later. If you look at the linear response at some particular um, scattering plane angle, uh, that shows nothing as you, as you pull down. But the second harmonic response shows this really sharp upturn. That's a critical temperature level of T omega. And as you, if you track how this T omega evolves as a function of whole doping, you can, you, can, uh, you can see that as I add more and more holes into it, this T omega gets monotonically suppressed, okay? just like the nail temperature. But if you compare this to where the actual nail transition lies, you find that actually this, temp this T omega that we find systematically occurs at higher temperature than the nail, than the nail temperature. And so this sort of phase boundary looks you know, suspiciously like a, a pseudo-gap boundary. Um, we have yet to, you know, photo emission states have yet to sort of pin down T star, the pseudo-gap temperature in this material. But um, you know, if you ask me in the, in the break, if, if you ask me afterwards, I can tell you a little bit about work we've been doing on cuprates to establish that relationship. OK, so I hopefully I've convinced you that this nonlinear output technique is an effective probe of not just structural symmetries, but also interesting electronic phases that have interesting broken symmetries. It's complementary to diffraction-based probes for these reasons. And I've showed you that there's a, you know, you can see these subtle distortions that are hard to pick up by diffraction, and you can even pick up these weird, you know, electronic orderings that, that may be hard to see in other techniques. Okay. And maybe it's maybe it's related to pseudo -gap. All right, thanks. Thank you.
Uh, did you say you were going to measure this uh, hidden order, you were going to try to observe this in the queue crate, or, or have you done it? We've what? done it, we've done it. And um, what do you see there? Right. So, thanks, I wanted, to, I wanted someone to ask me that, because I wanted to show, <laughs> I wanted to show two more slides. <laughs> oh, 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 I'm sorry, very, very importantly, this, let, let me say that this is not, uh, I can't take credit for this work. This, was, this work was done by a very talented postdoc, Dr. Lee Zal and my group, who was responsible for most of what you saw. Uh, Dr. Trachinsky was the person who, uh, built the instrument, and uh, how and John have also been intimately involved. And I need to thank, of course, our materials collaborators at the University of Kentucky, and we've benefited tremendously from theory input on, on this entire project from uh, Natasha Perkins at, at, and her student Yuri at um, Minnesota, and Rebecca, who's in the audience here, um, as well as Ron Lipschitz at, at Tel Aviv. Okay, so um, let me not take credit for this. This is really their, 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 their work. But now let me move on to Kubernetes. So we've done this, we, we decided to start with Wiley Steel because it's you know, sort of well, widely recognized as the cleanest Kubernetes out there. Um, the Kubernetes, uh, you know, as I mentioned already, consists of these sort of square copper oxygen planes. So what we've done is we think we've done the analogous experiment on Kubernetes. This is what we find, okay? So we find again, in the winter response, nothing's happening with temperature, just like, uh, the, which is consistent with, you know, reflectivity measurements that have been published in the past. Um, but in second harmonic, we see this upturn very dramatically, actually, at, at some temperatures, well called T omega. And if I plot T omega on the phase, on the known phase diagram of YBCO, boy, it, it falls along the pseudo gap line beautifully. And more, moreover, you know, our technique can actually go into the superconducting dome. And so we see that this line actually penetrates into the dome, seeming, well, suggestively, um, terminating at some quantum critical point, maybe just beyond optimal doping. So, you remember I said in the year days we couldn't quite tie T star to T omega nicely. In the cooperates, um, there is pretty convincing that they're they're having the same temperature. So whatever this phase is, is you know now observed in the pseudo gap regime of two two different materials, whether it's universal or not. Two is not enough to say. Any other questions, uh, Jim? Uh, Jim here. Uh, okay, go ahead. I was just, just going to ask, uh, is there any conceivable experiment that experimentalists might imagine that would be able to detect the loop current? But, but, but there are, there are uh, other sources of evidence. Most, I would say probably most, uh, uh, most notably the spin, spin flip neutron interaction. So um, there, there, I don't think there are many, maybe one beam line in the world that has the sensitivity to look at that, but you know, there are groups that have shown as you cross T star, there's a there's suddenly signal in the split flip channel, and it's happening at a cube of zero wave vector. So that's that's also supporting evidence for this kind of blue card order. Although it doesn't have to. So are these John Gravarma's loops that he proposed to uh, uh, give the, the phenomenology that was discussed in the first talk? Yeah. So um, our, our our, our results are sort of, are consistent with that order, but uh, you know I, I, just, I, have to, I have to say that I, I remain a bit agnostic about it because uh, we, we, we can only tell you point of symmetries and there are many alternatives that may be able to fit that point of symmetry. But well, Chandra's look cards are one of them. I assume that Chandra's excited about this. Uh, he, he has expressed excitement. Daniel, can I? There's one question. Was there a question there at the back? So first you and then Daniel. Okay. Uh, so in the uh, in the cuprates as well as in the STM measurements on the uh, iridates uh, that you referenced, uh, there's a lot of inhomogeneity in the samples, and that seems kind of characteristic. So uh, you've shown some inhomogeneity that come from the domains of these. So uh, does the inhomogeneity in the STM measurements, uh, can this be explained somehow by the inhomogeneity of, of your domains? So I, I, don't, I don't think so, um, because the, the inhomogeneity people are seeing in STM is on the nanoscale, which is far less than, which is far smaller than what we're seeing. So we're really seeing the average of, of what the STM position is. Um, so I think those are, those are different, different phase separation phenomena. So another question I had was, um, So uh, I'll, a couple of questions. One for clarification here. So this breaks inversion symmetry? Yes. Yeah. 
Okay, so it's not as interesting. Okay. Another question is um, uh, these surface based nonlinear optics techniques have, have been around and applied in surface physics for a long time. So actually, I got a colleague at Davis say, well, is this, this is not necessarily a novel probe, it, but you're, why hasn't it been applied earlier to these strongly correlated systems? Not to no, no, put no, down no, method, no, it's no. fantastic work, I think it's beautiful work. The question is, why hasn't this, why hasn't this been applied before? It's, it's a very fair question. There, there, there's, there's a many part answer to that. Okay. You're right, this is, this is a wonderful probe for surface physics, which I didn't mention because um, in, even, even though the electric dipole contribution is forbidden in the center, the bulk of the center symmetric material, the surface is inherently bright inversion, so we're all allowed in surfaces. So this is used to look at, you know, um, uh, you know surface reconstruction, semiconductor field, and so forth. Um, one reason why it hasn't been carried out in the way we showed is because in these materials, which I didn't have time to say, the surface contribution is extraordinarily weak. I mean, it might have to do with quasi two dimensionality. Um, and so the signals that we're pulling out are, are very, very, very small. That's one, that's one answer. The other answer is that um, it's really having to do with the alignment. And so um, with, sem with semiconductor wafers, you get these beautiful, large, flat surfaces that, are, um, that, that, that can be studied this way um, with much more ease. Um, whereas if you're trying to do things on very small spots at low temperatures, that creates challenges. And you have to do this sort of optical grading technique. So the grading, the grading technique is really the new, the new aspect here to be able to get the sensitivity to uh, weak scattering off of these surfaces and small uh, domains. Yeah. Well. So the, the, the rotating scattering plane principle is what enables you to do things low temperature, right. high fields, and the grading is what enables you to be able to localize your spot on sample and not have your beam process the Thank you. That's, that's a great. Answer. And I just wanted to do one last question that, that follows on Jim's question. So if, um, if these are potentially the currents, isn't um, USR a way to go after the loop currents? Absolutely. Although it depends upon whether you want to land in the sample. Absolutely, and there's been uh, an NMR. Okay. And it's been, uh, it's been a source of controversy as to why they don't see it. So, uh, you know, they're, they're and if, so, so they, they don't see it in these local probes, and there's been theoretical pushback that, okay, maybe it's a difference in time scale between the neutrons and the and, and, uh, and, and USR neutron or NMR probes. Um, okay. <coughs> that's not your concern. You're, you're producing this beautiful data that's showing us this hidden order, and that that's not your concern in a way. That, that's uh, other, other probe yeah. concerns, yeah. Any other questions? Um, yeah. Um, yeah. You are doing a strong analogy with the rates, and this is very uh, surprising that you, uh, things seem to match that well. Yeah. But what about the conductivity? Yeah, so uh, I think this is the thing which will be the easiest to see. That's a great so question. Why don't you see it at all? That's a really good question. And, and what, I, I don't know, what, I, what I'll say it might, be, it might be controversial, I'm not sure. But if you look at let's let's take one of these curves. Let's look at let's look at uh, I don't know. Uh, let's look at this one in optimal doping, where T star is just a little bit above T C. So in this case, you as you pull down, you cross T star, you cross this um, X-ray diffraction data that shows charge reversion, and then you cross T C. And in all of our data sets, you know it shows this order crap that doesn't look like it cares at all about T C, doesn't care at all about T C D W. It's something that's very independent. Of it. Happens to terminate somewhere near the optimal domain. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, I think this, this order here. Not that I think I'm pretty confident. This, whatever we see here doesn't compete for Fermi surface real estate with those orders. Um, the only thing it might do is maybe, <coughs> maybe there's a critical fluctuation that you know enhance the uh, enhance pairing or something. But uh, it's certainly not a phase that's sort of Any, any technique should give you that. Right, so the problem comes back to um, 
Jim's question about, about the, sorry, Peter's question about doping, yeah. which is, you know, we just need, I think, I think, you know, chemically, if we can find a way to stuff more carriers into the bulk, you know, we might be able to reach those higher, high, sufficiently high doping levels to see but, but even here, yeah, it's 30, 30 or 70 calorie sample, the offshoots don't show this. Yeah, exactly. Even at low concentration, you should see a DC, a low DC. Can you say it again? I didn't catch yeah. At low doping, you should still see a superconductivity. If there was a connection of these things with superconductivity, you should see it in the bulk samples. Ah, so you're saying maybe we catch yeah, you even there. Catch this tail. So why don't you have anything there? That's a, really, that's a good question. Sure. Yeah, I have an um, old story to uh, remember. In the very early days of uh, cuplates, where the samples were not single crystals, but very highly pure and uniform uh, polycrystalline samples. Uh, in the early days of uh, pseudogap, before we knew it was a pseudogap, there were distinct anomalies in sound propagation characteristics. In some shear mode, there was a pipad anomaly. In the damping, there was something like a gap opening. Uh, in many transport measurements, like conductivity, if you measure DTT of log rho, you will see some anomaly. These were subtle. And at the time, it seemed, I can give you the references, um, that these were indicative of a clear phase transition. And if you looked at high quality crystallographic data, Epical oxygen position seem to move. What I don't know because I left the field is what is the current status of those kinds of measurement? Have they been repeated? Have they been verified or thrown away? Or do you, can you can you say that the uh, pseudo gap transition is now viewed to be a bona fide phase transition or? you have this clausius clapeyron equation for first order phase transitions. And so there is a continuous transition analog uh, used to be known by PIPAR relations. And there are many uh, susceptibilities which are related to each other uh, across a phase transition. Sure. And one of the things, if you want to call it a phase transition or not, in the old days, what people used to do is look at these various susceptibilities. Like a conventional will be specific heat, thermal expansion coefficient, uh, you know, things of that sort. And they're related to each other. And if you get, and because they are thermodynamically mandated that you have to have this. So are these tested or? Well, I looked at the Los Alamos data, and this is very similar to data we had years ago. But uh, what I can't tell is what is the status of the surrounding evidence to point to the nature. That's really a phase transition. Yeah, I, uh, I, I perhaps haven't studied that carefully enough, but I, I don't know the status of But this does look like a continuous uh, phase transition, and you've added the extra feature that it also is creating the inversion symmetry, yeah. which is really important. Uh, so yeah, it does look like 
So, uh, in view of the fact that we are running late, uh, let's continue the discussion over a coffee break. And we'll have to have a condensed coffee break. So, we'll convene again at 11 o'clock so that we can adhere to time. Some people are leaving. So we'll have